Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today we are continuing on with the Evidence for Evolution series, but this time we're going to veer away slightly from the topic of evolution itself, as we need to have a basic understanding of geology in order to fully appreciate just how much evidence for evolution there is in the fossil record. So today I'm going to be covering some aspects of geology. I have also been asked to make it easier to tell which source I am using at which times in the video, so I have now numbered my sources and will display which number I'm referring to on screen. So let's go! Geology is a big topic. I couldn't possibly cover the entire range of subjects that are encompassed by the term geology in one single video. But as geology is not itself evidence for evolution, I will do my best to cover the relevant aspects here. The relevant aspects being how we can tell past environments from geology, and how we can determine ages. I will spend this video discussing the different environments that we see in the different strata. Strata, put simply, are the horizontal layers that can be found in sedimentary rock. They can be paper thin, or several meters thick, depending on how they are formed. But that's the general idea. Geologists can tell, by looking at the different characteristics of the strata, what types of environments they were deposited in. So for instance, tillite tends to lack internal strata, be poorly sorted, with grains like pebbles and gravel being completely surrounded by the finer grains, will be massive, and will contain few fossils. Tillite is the result of glacial ice eroding rock as it moves across the continent. Picture it like pushing sand on a beach. The sand gets moved from where it was and pushed forward as you move. It doesn't discriminate based on grain size. A glacier will push a boulder just as well as fine grains of sand, so it ends up as a poorly sorted sediment. Because of the nature of the deposition and how slowly it forms, it is unlikely, though not impossible, that glacial deposits will bury an organism's remains fast enough for fossilization, and so not many fossils are expected. Tillite is actually one of the lines of evidence for continental drift. Because it is so indiscriminate in its makeup, if you can find two beds of tillite on opposite sides of the ocean that have closely matching characteristics, you can be fairly certain that it is actually one bed that has been split over geologic time. And we do find beds like that. And matching the tillite is more than just looking at the characteristics of the tillite itself. It is also looking at what kind of strata are surrounding it and matching up the sequence of strata. And we do know that it is formed by glaciers because we can see active glaciers depositing sediment in a similar fashion today. This is one of the keys to a lot of these geologic environments. We know how different environments deposit sediment differently because we can find examples of those types of deposition happening today. But let's back up a bit. Tillite is a sedimentary rock. Sedimentary rocks are rocks that are composed of other rocks that have been eroded in one way or another, and then reformed into its own rock. So sedimentary rocks are rocks like sandstone, which are made up of grains of sand, or limestone, which are usually made up of skeletal remains of marine organisms like coral and mollusks, which are then subject to enough pressure to cement the sediments into rock in a process called lithification. Metamorphic rock is rock that has undergone metamorphism, which are changes to the mineral structure and makeup of solid rock, usually by high temperatures and pressures. Basically, it's a rock whose physical properties are changed without quite melting it all the way into magma. And that's where igneous rocks come in. Igneous rock is rock which has been completely melted into magma, or never solidified in the first place, and either cools slowly under the surface working its way toward the surface over thousands to millions of years to form intrusive igneous rocks, or exiting by way of volcanoes and fissures to cool quickly on the surface. We can also tell when sediment is deposited by a river, known as fluvial deposition. Fluvial deposition can usually be split into two categories, the riverbed itself and the alluvial fan. An alluvial fan is similar to a river delta with one main important distinction. Deltas are when the mouth of a river opens into a standing body of water, while alluvial fans are when a river or stream spreads into a receiving basin that is not already occupied by water. The fan itself is conical in shape, and is usually made up of conglomerate or arcos rocks, and the sediment in a fan is typically gravel-sized and shows a decrease in grain size as you move further away from the mouth of the fan. It's even possible to determine whether the sediment in the fan originated as part of a landslide, or if it was just a normal stream flow deposition. There are also instances where geologists can tell that the fan is the result of a catastrophic sudden discharge of water resulting in a sheet flood, 
And because fans tend to be high-energy oxidizing environments, there are not many fossils to speak of. Some examples of ancient alluvial fans include the Hornellen Basin of Norway, the Gas Bay Peninsula in Canada, the Mount Toby conglomerate in Massachusetts, and the Todos Santos Formation in New Mexico. And since we started with alluvial fans by comparing them to river deltas, let's just take a look at deltas next. Deltas happen where rivers meet larger bodies of water. Rivers carry sediment with them as they flow, and when they flow into a larger body of water, they slow down. This slowing causes them to drop the sediment that they had been carrying, creating a pile of sediment on the floor of the larger body of water. Eventually, the sediment piles up to a point where it is above the surface of the water, and becomes dry land with the river forking around it. Then the two new forks begin the process again, and over time, as the river keeps forking around, the deltas become larger and more complicated. In deltas, we usually find marine and non-marine mudstone, siltstone, sandstone, and even coal. There will also be ripple marks in the rock as the result of the waves and the current action on the sediment. There are also different types of deltas, which depend on the relative density of the river water when compared to the water that it's flowing into. When the river water's density is roughly equal to the density of the water it's flowing into, there's a rapid mixing of waters resulting in an abrupt deposition of the sediment load of the river, and this is most common at the mouths of coarse grain rivers. If the river water is more dense than the water it's joining, which is common in flood events, then the river water forms a current that moves along the bottom and deposits its sediment on the more gentle slopes of the delta to form turbite deposits. And thirdly, and probably most common, is when the river water is less dense than the water it flows into, which is common where rivers meet oceans and seas, as salt water is more dense than fresh water. In these conditions, the river water forms a current on top of the salt water and can flow quite some distance away from the shore, carrying sediment the whole way. Eventually, positive ions in the seawater neutralize the negative charges on the clay particles, causing the aggregation of fine sediment into small lumps in a process known as flocculation. This tends to make for a larger delta with a very shallow dip of about 1 degree, as opposed to the 10 to 20 degree dips common in the other types of deltas. Deltas are one environment that is known as a transitional environment. That is, it is an environment that marks the boundary between two different environments, the two environments in this case usually being fluvial and shallow marine. Common fossils in delta formations include terrestrial plants, mollusks, and bioturbation, which is just geology talk for the sediment having been disturbed by an organism before it lithified, and that disturbance is captured in the fossil record, so footprints and the like. Some examples of ancient deltaic systems include the Wilcox Group of Texas, the Dunvegan Formation in Canada, the San Miguel Formation in Texas, and the Misoa Formation in Venezuela, which is one of the larger deltas extending about 250 kilometers from its source. Now let's talk about the Aeolian desert environments. Usually when we think of deserts, we think of large, hot areas covered in sand dunes. But in reality, a desert is simply defined by how much rainfall it gets per year. And by this measure, the Sahara is only the third largest desert in the world, with it being beaten out by Antarctica and the Arctic. So there are a myriad of sub-environments in the larger category of desert. Alluvial fans are actually one common sub-environment, but also there are intermittent streams, intermittent saline lakes, sand dune fields, sediment-covered interdune areas, and bare rocks. In desert aeolian environments, for obvious reasons, we usually find sandstone, and the fossils that are found are usually terrestrial reptiles. But deserts aren't the only kind of aeolian environment. Any sediment that is deposited by wind is aeolian sediment, and one of the most common forms of aeolianite is the coastal limestone made up of the carbonate sediment that is the result of shallow marine organisms like the seashells of mollusks. In order for this type of aeolianite to form, there needs to be a warm climate, enough wind to form sediment from the beaches into dunes, and relatively little rainfall. Now that's relatively little rainfall, but it does need some rainfall to percolate through the sediment in order to facilitate lithification. Last up for sedimentation environments, I want to talk about one particular aspect of marine sedimentation, the formation of chalk. Chalk is essentially an accumulation of a specific category of microscopic plankton, coccolithophores. Coccolithophores have a spherical skeleton, referred to as a coccosphere, which is made up of disks of calcium carbonate. When the plankton dies, its skeleton sinks to the ocean floor, 
over time these skeletons would accumulate, and this is an incredibly slow process that requires relatively calm waters. Turbulent waters would have easily swept up the discarded coccospheres into other depositional environments which would have had other sediments that accumulate faster, and so would greatly outnumber the coccospheres. Now, in a stroke of serendipity, my son actually came home from school today after learning about geology with a vial of water in which had been placed gravel, sand, and chalk dust. After shaking the vial, the gravel sinks to the bottom almost immediately, with the sand settling in not too long after, but the vial has been left undisturbed for hours now, and the water is still blue with the chalk sediment floating in it. This is actually a good example of why you need a calm environment in order for the coccospheres to be able to sink to the bottom. It just, it, with turbulent water, it would just get swept up in the water itself and would never quite settle. The deposition of chalk requires a delicate balance between how many coccolithophores are alive near the surface of the ocean, the rate at which they dissolve once they reach the bottom, and the rate of accumulation of terrigenous sediment, that is, sediment that is washed into the ocean from terrestrial environments. If there's too much carbon dioxide dissolved into the water, then the coccospheres will dissolve before they can become part of the calcareous ooze that would eventually lithify into the chalk beds. If there's too much terrestrial sediment, it will overpower the chalk. And the waters had to be relatively calm for extremely long periods of time. The calcareous ooze accumulates at a rate of about 1 to 6 centimeters per thousand years. We can even tell from looking at the chalk beds when the climate was more conducive to their formation. There is evidence of cyclic deposition, where there are periods of low energy and steady accumulation rates, alternating with interruptions of deposition by high energy and possibly shallower waters. We also know that the calcareous ooze that results in chalk can only form in water that is less than 4,500 meters deep, with the estimate for the waters being around two to 300 meters deep. The chalk beds of South England contain three subdivisions, dubbed the lower chalk, the middle chalk, and the upper chalk. The contacts between these layers are a gradual gradated change, which indicates that the environmental changes that led to these distinct layers were also gradual changes. And now that we know some of the basics of sedimentation, we can move on to stratigraphy. Stratigraphy is the study of the geologic strata, concerning the order and relative positions of the strata and how they relate to the geologic timescale. When looking at the rock layers, we can find strata that are laid down in the exact same order and which share otherwise unique characteristics, but they're spread out across continents. An example are the Appalachian Mountains of North America, which have a very close continuity with the Caledonian Mountains of Scotland and Scandinavia. This was the example that led to the original proposal of continental drift by Frank Bursley Taylor. The study of strata and the matching of stratigraphic sequences in different locations have helped geologists piece together the history of the Earth, leading all the way back through the seven major supercontinents. The geologists who study stratigraphy use known information about how different types of sediments are deposited in different environments to create maps of the earth as it would have been during the different time periods represented in the strata. And I have only barely scratched the surface with regard to how detailed the study of sedimentation can get. Stratigraphy has, in the last half of the 20th century, matured into an incredibly accurate science, which is now used to predict the locations of petroleum and natural gas deposits. So in summary, we know an incredible amount of detail about where and how different types of rocks form, and how long these processes take. We then use this knowledge to map out the geology of the past, comparing the different rock layers to one another in different locations, and coordinating locations using the matching of sequences in the strata. Next week we'll be taking a look at the different dating methods that they can use to determine the ages of the rocks. Thanks for watching. If you're enjoying this series, remember to subscribe to be notified of new episodes, and consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash vicerhino. Patrons are what make this series possible, and I mean that in the most literal possible sense. Patrons also get some nice perks, like early access to my Friday videos. This past week, my patrons got early access to one Apologia's videos as well as a nice little bonus. And I'd also like to give extra special thanks this week to Stephen Bauman, who is a geologist who is kind enough to let me bother him from time to time when I get stumped. So thank you very much, Steve. See you next time!